All right, let's talk about relative tensors. It's really a continuation of our discussion of determinants, and we're working our way towards the levi civita symbols, some of the beautiful tensors in our subject. Okay, well first, a warm-up question. We've defined two permutation, two types of permutation symbols, with lower indices and with upper indices. EIJK and EIJK. And the interesting question is, are they related by index juggling? The notation certainly suggests that they do. But the question is, if we were to apply formal index juggling, let's say to this symbol, which means contracting with two covariant, with three covariant tensors, would it become equal to this symbol? So I'll repeat, notation certainly suggests that it does. And I've made a claim early on that the notation is never misleading. In this case, we'll find out it is misleading. And I'll say a couple things about that. All right, let's lower each of the three indices on this object. That means contracting with ZIR, ZJS, and Z. A, T. And of course, from the determinant lecture, you know that this expression is precisely the determinant of the covariant metric tensor times the permutation symbol with lower indices. So it equals Z, you remember, Z is the symbol that denotes the determinant of the metric tensor. I'm not quite sure if we introduced it before in these lectures. So I'll accept that as the definition. I usually write this definition this way. Z is the determinant of the covariant metric tensor. And I just put two dots, two lower dots, to indicate that we're dealing with the covariant metric tensor. I don't want to put i and j here, because then they would be sort of hanging there without a match on the left-hand side. So there will be neither lie nor dummy, so not quite appropriate in tensor notation. So I'll just use this notation. And you'll see that I'll use similar notation for the Jacobians. Okay, so that's the definition of z. Perhaps it's the last time that z, not quite the last time, almost the last time, that z is used to denote some kind of object. Z times ERST. Huh. ERST. So I would say we were hoping, in order for the index juggling formalism to remain valid, we were hoping that the answer would just be ERST. But no, it equals Z times ERST. So these two objects are not related by index juggling. So in this case, the indicial notation is somewhat misleading, because when the same letter is used, and just the placement of the indices is what differentiates the objects, we immediately think that they're related by index juggling. And, unfortunately, they're not. So what's the saving grace here? The saving grace here is that these objects, as we're about to find out, are not tensors. So they're actually not used all that much in tensor notation. So it's something to keep in mind that these objects are not related by index juggling, but it rarely comes up. Why? Because these objects are rarely used. Why? Because they're not tensors. As we'll find out in a moment, they're relative tensors. So let's see what that is. So this was just a warm-up. So now let's get to the real question. Are these objects tensors? Well, let's see what it would mean for them to be tensors. Let's once again do a hopeful transformation and see whether we indeed get what we're hoping to get. So let's, hmm, I don't know, let's start with this object. Permutation simple with the lower indices. E, I, J, K and contract it with the three Jacobians 
in the hope that we will get e i prime j prime k prime, in the hope that it is a tensor. So let's see what we would actually get. So here's the transformation j i i prime j j j prime j k k prime and our hope is that the answer will be e i prime j prime k prime which would mean that this object is a tensor but of course we're not getting that you can see why we're getting something similar to what we did before this is the type of combination that produces the determinant that produces the determinant of this matrix so let's denote the determinant of this matrix by J. Let me document this here. J is the determinant of the Jacobian where the prime index is on the bottom. Where the prime index is on the bottom. So maybe like this. And this might be opposite of what I'm actually doing in the book. So hopefully it's not. So in the book there's J and J prime, and it might be the inverse. So hopefully it's consistent with the book, but if it's the inverse of what it is in the book, that's not a big deal. Okay, let me just correct, it, correct the placement of this a little bit. So the result is, of course, J, as we agree, times, I'm about to write it in when the board tries, times i prime, j prime, k prime. So not quite a tensor. A tensor with this additional factor of j. <laughs> I'm not sure why my expressions keep sliding down. I think it's because I'm writing on the board and trying to look at the camera. So, without waiting for the board to drive, j times e i prime, j prime, k prime. A little bit better. Okay, so not quite a tensor. It's a tensor with this additional factor of j, the determinant of that Jacobian, popping out. So it is called a relative tensor. And because the power here is 1, it is a relative tensor of water one. So I will, excuse me, of weight one. The term is weight. Weight. So I don't want to mispronounce it more than a couple times. I'll write it here. Weight. So that means that this permutation tense, permutation symbol is a relative tensor of water one. Let's learn that this symbol with the upper indices is a relative tensor of weight minus one. Let's see. I'll try to write it straight. E I J K. Let's transform it. I prime I J J prime J J K prime K equals. Of course, now we have the determinant of this matrix. And it's a fundamental fact that the determinant of this Jacobian is the matrix inverse, this Jacobian is the matrix inverse of this Jacobian, so its determinant is the inverse of this determinant. So equals j to the negative one e i prime j prime k prime. So this means that this object is a contravariant, is a relative contravariant tensor of order negative one, of order, excuse me once again, of weight negative one. And that, and that's sort of a little bit interesting because if you think about it, these two objects have identical values. They're really identical objects. Yet, it can be seen as a, as a relative tensor of weight 1 and also as a relative tensor of weight negative 1. How is that possible that the same object 
can be a relative tensor of both order 1 and order negative 1. Which one is it? Well, the, the, the answer is simple. As a, if you view it as a contravariant tensor, relative tensor, then it's a contravariant relative tensor of weight negative 1. And if you view it as a covariant tensor, then it's a covariant, then it's a covariant relative tensor of, of weight 1. So there's really no contradiction there. Okay, so that's what relative tensors are. Relative tensors of various weights are pretty much, they're actually a generalization of regular tensors. A regular tensor is a relative tensor of weight 0. You see, relative tensors just have this additional, para additional factor of j to some power that constitutes the weight of the tensor. So, a slight generalization, and that allows us to think of these objects as almost tensors. They're slightly generalized tensors. This one is a tensor of weight 1, and this one is a tensor of weight negative 1. We can easily think of a tensor of weight 2. Let's look at this object. This is the determinant of the covariant metric tensor. Or maybe it'll be minus 2, we'll see in a moment. So here's how it works. Z. Z, by definition, is E, I, J, K. E, R, S, T. Note that in the previous lecture, because we focused an object with one upper, one lower index, we hardly ever saw a combination like this. We just had permutation symbols with one set of upper indices and one set of lower indices, which were then, of course, combined into a single delta system, making everything a little bit more concise. But now we don't have that luxury, because both indices are lower on the metric tensor, so we have to write it like this. Uh, Z, I, R, Z, J, S, and Z, K, T, and, of course, I'm missing a factor of 1 over 3 factor, which is not so relevant for this discussion, but of course it needs to be correct. So from this, it's very easy to show that this is a relative tensor of weight negative 2, because we have a tensor of weight negative 1, another tensor of weight negative 1, and three tensors of weight 0. And it's super easy to show that multiplying two relative tensors of given weights results in another relative tensor whose weight is the combined weights of the terms in the product. So this will be a tensor. Z is a tensor, relative tensor of weight negative 2. And similarly, Z, I guess I can just write Z inverse. This would be the determinant of the contravariant metric tensor. Well, you can very easily guess. If this one transforms according to the rule that that has the appearance if this one transforms according to the rule that has the appearance of j to the minus 2 then this one will transform according to the rule that has the appearance of j squared so this one has a weight of 2 is a relative tensor of weight 2. And I just realized that it is opposite in the book. This would be considered a tensor of weight negative 1, and this would be considered a tensor of weight 1. But it doesn't matter. As long as you're consistent, you can adopt your own convention. The convention in the book is opposite because I express the primed components in terms of the unprimed components. And of course there, j would end up on the other side with a power of negative 1, and similarly here. So I use the opposite convention in the textbook, but
but that's perfectly fine. So we, the conventions don't have to be the same for in all places. Okay, so let's just write down literally what's easy to obtain. So I kind of said that it's easy to conclude, but didn't write down what it is that's easy to conclude. What's easy to conclude is that the metric tensor, the determiner of the metric tensor, evaluated in an alternative coordinate system will equal j to the minus 2. Well, now I have to be consistent. So you see here, we were relating unprimed to the primed coordinates. And I put the j on the side with the unprimed coordinates. So now I have to be careful and put this determinant since I'm putting this determinant on the side with the unprimed coordinates, I have to put a plus here. Okay, so that's the rule by which the determinant of the metric tensor, of the covariant metric tensor, transforms. And of course, the determinant of the contravariant metric tensor will transform by a similar rule with a minus 2 here. Just take a inverses of both sides. Okay, one final note before we move on to the Levi Civita symbols. They're actually right around the corner. Which is known as this. If I were, there's just enough space to take the square root of z, the positive square root of z. So we can see we're basically restricting our attention to coordinate transformations for which the, the determinant of the Jacobian is positive. If we don't restrict our, our attention to those kinds of transformations, then there are different sign conventions that we have to really worry about. We still have to worry about them, but we can maybe ignore them for a little bit longer. Okay, so this will too be a relative tensor, a relative invariant of weight negative 1, because the square root will we'll divide the weight by 2. Okay, so this is called the volume element. Volume element. And of course, it plays a central role in integration. Volume element. We'll talk about its physical geometric interpretation at a later date. But for now, just remember that this is a relative tensor of weight negative 1 weight negative one. Okay, so I will now pause, erase the board, and we'll talk about the beautiful Levi-Civita symbols. Thank you very much.